Were you consciously aware you were creating something unique in terms of a style as you were doing it or only in retrospect? You look back and you're like, oh, this is something unique. I'm kind of at a, a point in my life where I would say one of the things that is coming up is is the idea of integration and um i'm sort of from a personal development standpoint from you know i'm a pretty active meditator so that element shows up there and then also i'm sort of you know you know i'm 41 so i'm not a, i'm not a kid anymore I, you know, i'm asking sort of the questions like what do i want to do here and also like what am i afraid to do moving back to new york the original impetus was to be predominantly a jazz drummer and certainly there's a lot of um substrata uh in 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 that develop like i've put some some blood sweat and tears into that particular language and i would also say that um I'm, I'm also very, for whatever skills that I have in that particular language, I'm also aware of how limited I am. Um, like there, I can name, you know, 10 drummers, if not more, that I would say are stylistically more beautiful in that language than, I mean, I could list a hundred more. Um, so I have like this sort of mature, uh, uh, I have like I have a healthy self confidence in terms of jazz, um, and I also um, am aware of my limitations within that. Um, and I'm, I've also given myself permission to 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 no longer um, sort of remain in in a particular idiom based out of a sense of obligation. Um, I mean, even though like. So it's it's a balance because this particular type of music, which I always hope to be part of for my dying days, and I you know I still have aspirations to play with certain musicians on a particular level in that world, and I still kind of tangentially view myself in that world. When I came back to New York um, during COVID, which was a really interesting time, teaching at a high level, very often there was a lot of times of reflecting and I'm at a point now I, I feel like um, to not spend too I mean this is kind of a deep question so I might have to take a minute here um, I sort of feel like the 13 year old who set out to get good on the drums has sort of done his job and and I'm really proud of that 13 year old kid um, there was sort of a survival instinct about that particular approach, which sort of guided me in a lot of ways through a lot of ups and downs that I've had. And what I sort of feel like what's happening now as I'm moving into a more of an adult perspective is asking, I'm starting to see the things that, including the jazz perspective and also being aware of all other types of music and, and, and other aspects of, of of my life that I'm interested, I'm more interested about putting them all together. Pedagogy is a big part of it because a big part of pedagogy is the physics of technique, the physics of, of rhythm. And I think for me, like that's been a really particular gateway to understanding. But before I started playing drums, I was also a visual artist. And I think, so I just recorded my record. And if you looked at my drum set with like my cymbal up to here, you know, it's like, that's like the ultimate kid's playground. That's really what it is. The vector system, I'm really, really proud of. And I feel like um, I've, I've received some feedback for, from, from people in a lot of different types of music. Like I've been receiving um, a, a, a friend of mine um, who's the drummer of, of, of Car Bomb, Elliot Hoffman. You know, it's like, it's interesting when like metal drummers are saying this is sort of the piece of the puzzle. For me, it was, I'm, I'm also kind of like a wannabe physicist. I mean, like to say I'm a wannabe physicist is, I, I don't know anything about math, but I, as someone who studies the physics of the instrument 
fairly, you know, in, in a really deep way, I'm, I'm, I, I like, I see how I could have been a physicist if I knew math and I had a different background. Um, there's an inquiry to that that I really particularly enjoy. And then Tigran's music was a big um, inspiration where there were sort of polarities in time. And I've always been, you know, in, independence has been a big gateway for my emancipation. Subdivisions has been a big independence uh, a, a gateway as well. And I would say I'm not, I'm, I'm good in some ways and I'm not good in other ways. Um, the work that I've done with Temporal, with Austin White, where, you know, he, that was a world that I didn't expect to move into, which is sort of the modular synth world, which is a world that, that I'm actually trying to fully engage in with right now. Like I'm trying to, I'm actively trying to play with like Trent Reznor and um, I'm playing with people that are masters of that craft. And I, it was such a beautiful, like with Austin, it's so great because that ambient ex experimental electronic music creates these textures that allow sort of all of these processes and rock as well. That's like a whole other thing, Jimmy, you know, like that's part of the whole equation too. It created the capacity to ask myself to see how like Tigran's music or these, uh, there are these polarities of time. But then the question then was, well, what if we like actually rather than suggesting two times actually created it. And then, and then the wormhole started happening where it was like, well, then how do we bridge that? And then it was just like, all of a sudden I had this music around me where, especially in the modular world, which is something I'm barely starting in. It's like, this is actually applicable. And it gave me a particular license to pursue it. And the big thing is finding musicians that really inspired me. So Austin has been a critical part of my development. Um, there's a guy by the name of Alessandro Cortini, who is the, um, he started out as the guitarist and synth player of Nine Inch Nails and he became, he is now sort of like um, one of the great voices in, in terms of contemporary electronic music. And I've chatted with him a couple of times. He's really sweet. He knows that I want to play with him. Um, to find music that touches me on that level, which sort of helps me to remember who I was before I was a kid, like when I was a kid and just when I first started playing the drums, it was like an architectural diagram. It was like a somatic way of, of, of creating a cathedral. So for me, the vector system is a way to sort of honor that perspective. And what's really cool is seeing that there's a musical world there that's related to it. So it's kind of terrifying because there's a lot of people who are like, this doesn't make any sense. This is stupid, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I should be like a professional musician. And like, I want to like eventually like maybe get married and have like kids and some type of security. So let's like uh, create the most random sound, you know, like there's sort of a fear in, with that, but I'm finding that um, that particular reference has really resonated and it was more allowing the inner kid in me to explore and my job as the adult is I have all these tools like I have all these math and technical tools that I could just give this kid and be like well just try this and we could put it all together and I noticed that he within me was just really inspired and that's sort of where I'm at as a musician these days like my whole job is to provide that inner kid in me all the creative room to do whatever so it's to to end this rant it's a big process and i wasn't really thinking about it as being innovative i i just thought about it as being something that felt really pregnant with like an urgency and fun and kind of a risk and so i want to i'm going to keep expanding on it that was a long swear word answer no that was that was super interesting and as I'm ramping up these interviews for the channel, it's 
I just noticed that I'm gravitating toward people who, in addition to being technically proficient and having some accolades on the instrument, to some degree resisted the pressure to be like everybody else. Like, like the, those are the people I'm most interested in for some reason, like the Dan Weisses, the Nasheet Waits, the Marcus Gilmores, the Chris Daves, the people who just, you know, everybody was doing one thing and, and they went a different direction. So there are a bunch of directions we could, oh, go ahead. Well, I would say like, I used to mod, like Mark Juliana, I modeled for a long time. And he knows that I took a lesson with him. I'm like, I mean, I was just like, thanks. Cause I used to tag him in like 900 million videos. And when I first did Drumio, people were like, yeah, it's like sort of like Mark. And, and I, I really needed his archetype like that for me, his reference point was a crucial part of my development. Um, I think we, we go through phases of modeling. Um, Ari Honig, I went through a huge phase of modeling um, when he was my teacher. Um, I think, it, I think we, I think I, there's sort of, I think that there's a coherent truth that the farther we expound outward is really a correlation to the inner work that we do. And it's scary to ask yourself what you really want to do. Um, and sometimes it's easy to conform to ideas of, of being like others because I've, I've certainly done that. But then I started noticing when I gave myself permission also during that Drumeo period, which was a huge part of expansion in my life, um, there was this part of me that really pushed against the things that I had to do and wanted to really give myself creative licensure to achieve that. Instagram was really important because it helped me to connect to, I was living in Salt Lake at the time, which is a different community than New York, and I'll just leave it there. But it was really positive because it gave me, I was in my practice room teaching internationally, touring internationally, but creating my own thing. But I could also connect to like musicians in the UK that I really loved. I noticed that the reach was right there. And then I could define for myself what my musical role was. I could define for myself what I really wanted to do. And that was the same time that Jimmy Chamberlain entered my life, which is he's he's uh, I mean, if, I, I hope he doesn't watch this. Um, he's the most important. He's one of the more important people in my life. And uh, I would, you know, I, 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 I love him like a member of my family in, in like the deepest way. And um, he's been really important. He's actually, we sent him some tracks where he's going to play on my record. And I was at his house where we were doing like these joint lessons, which was a really crazy experience. And I was like, he's the reason that I started playing the drums. And um, it's, it's a really interesting phase now where I'm actually starting to work with Jeff Schroeder, who's the guitarist of the Pumpkins, and Jimmy and I are close, and we're working on my stuff. It's a weird thing to, like, give my kid the permission to actually enter what he really wanted to do, which is that world. And uh, I was at his house, and he said, the more you sound like other people, the more money they're, they're going to get. The more you sound like you the more money you're going to get. And it doesn't have to necessarily be money, but it's the idea that ultimately, I think, do you know who, uh, a, a friend of a friend of ours, uh, he said, like, you know, in art, nobody wants to pay for a copy. Everybody wants to get an original. At some point, I think we have to find within our nature who we are. And I think that's a really important thing for, for me. And not everybody might share that perspective. The students that I teach, I gravitate towards students that seek that kind of framework. Um, mm -hmm. And I think in this life, that's probably something that I, I, I kind of move toward. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, jumping off of that, let's talk a little bit about teaching. So, yeah, I've been interested in one particular thing you said, which was like giving your inner kid permission to break free of constraints. And that's definitely something that I've felt too. And I wonder if it's kind of endemic to be a, being a creative coming up in the New York jazz scene where it feels like there are a lot of constraints, some probably positive, some negative. But 
I, I want to bounce this off you. Say someone wants to learn the vector system, hypothetically, and they're only a few years into drumming. Should they learn the basics like independence and comping and all the classic stuff first? Or would you say they can start with vectors at any point? I, I have a, a student that I'm working with who is a college student and he wants to do it and, um, and he's, he's really talented. And I'm like, we can totally talk about that, but let's, let's talk about Mel Lewis first. Let's get our big band stuff together. Um, I think, I think what's, what I'm proud about the vector system is that, um, is that it's really clear. Like, I feel like the, the path of, of like pedagogically, like the steps in, inherent in it, if, if one wanted to really do the work, the pathway is there. It's, it's, there is a menu, there is a uh, recipe, if you will, like if you wanted to make it as a dish, it's a really intense dish, but every step is there. But I would say, the most important thing is like, if we're cooks, let's first learn how to make a steak. Let's first learn how to cook eggs. Let's first learn how to, to cut fish. Let's first learn how to do sort of the basics. Th those things are really important because what's one of the things that that particular approach really asks of us is, is a concept that I'm sort of calling the panoramic view. So another way of thinking about it is the way I sort of define mastery, and I'm not a master, but a way that one could describe that there's a sense of mastery over something is not only through repetition, well, repetition is a huge element, but it's the ability to, to have, and this is where independence, especially over form is really important because it's, and especially when we start talking like what the vector system really has to show us is we have to really know terms like polyrhythms, hemial is like we have to really know how the rhythms cadence. We have like there's a difference between hemiolic polyrhythm. Like a lot of people, and I've been guilty of this too, sort of misuse those those terms. Um, rhythm versus meter is another one that people misuse, and I've done that in the past as well. Um, what I think we want to achieve in every part of development is the capacity to see all aspects simultaneously and individually. And until we've gotten to a point where each one of those stepping stones has, has a level of, 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 of subjective objectivity, I don't think it's the healthiest approach to, to move to incredibly complex stuff. Okay, that tracks. Yeah, I, I have a similar paradigm where it's like, if you first move to a city and you're in a new neighborhood, I guess it's less relevant now with GPS, but say back in the past, you have to navigate everywhere linearly. Like go two blocks here, take a left, et cetera. And gradually you form a map of where things are spatially. And then once you have that, you, you have like three quarters of the jigsaw puzzle and then you can add in other pieces. It's definitely the same with martial arts, like with jujitsu. When you're first starting out, everything just seems random. You can only learn things linearly. And then the more of a synthesis you get, the more you start to view things in terms of their spot in the jigsaw puzzle and what problem they solve. I think that also, like that's a really important aspect in terms of a teacher in terms of like pedagogically what i think an, an educator sort of has to do that's a good point it is is be aware of to the what I, we want to stretch our students to an individual capacity that they're on based on their own unique sets of skills and weaknesses and individual strengths you know but if you're you want you want to you want to really develop the the skill to be able to observe one student how they handle information like are they are they able to to really map all the things or are they able to map only part of it and 
we ultimately have to do that for ourselves too. You know that. So whenever we work with really complex stuff, we start to get good when we know how to break it down in just the way you described. Yeah. yeah actually, I want to I want to zig instead of zag here and take a segue off of that because. I noticed that you do one-on-one -on -one coaching with a very small handful of students you work intensively with. And I'm just poised at the precipice of jumping into something like that. So without divulging any secret sauce, I wonder if you could talk in generalities about what the experience is like for somebody who does coaching with you. Uh, for myself or for my clients? Whatever would be more useful, but I suppose my my feeling would be start with the POV of the client. So the way that I teach is the way I sort of describe it is like a graduate level immersion catered to an individual's life. So I have clients that are very active touring uh, drummers. I have clients that are people that have a full-time job and they're trying to integrate the drums into their life more. I have clients that are drummers that are trying to develop a teaching, uh, their teaching career. I have, I have, I have pedagogical clients where we refine their teaching. We roll, we role play teaching scenarios to find the most expedient and efficient ways to diagnose problems in the most creative and efficient ways possible. Um, I have beginners. I have a client who's a, a last year he he was a he was a beginner and was not aware of subdivisions. And that's actually been a real joy because now he's operating and seeing the whole panoramic view, sight reading, doing everything. Um, and and that gives me a, a chance to see how efficient certain systems can be um and i have people like all over the world like who are, in some ways are better than i am in in a lot of ways so it's different for everybody um the thing that i do is i create so like it's 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 really intense it's it's very individual we we get to know each other i get to understand who the person is and then my job is i create an end term goal. What does the exit strategy look like? What are the what are the goals that you want to achieve on our last lesson here? What what do you want to walk away with? Then I construct a linear game plan, long term, medium term, and short term. And I have a whole bunch of rubrics. So like for instance, the rubrics that I use, I'll just name a few. So on every and and I feel bad. So former students that I didn't use this with, I've not always been a good teacher, Nate, just so you know. Um, uh, I'll, I, there, I've, I've not always been the greatest. I think you're being humble, but I see you have the growth mindset, so. No, but I mean, like, you, there, 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 I've, I've had to learn. Um, so I have these rubrics um, that are my job, and then I have rubrics that are, my clients' jobs. So on every assignment, I give them a P, S, A, or an SG, primary, secondary, auxiliary, and stretch goal. And we sort of modify each lesson related to our, our overall curriculum related to each, each assignment has one of those rubrics that I, that's my job. And it's really clear what we're doing. And I can see like the week to week assignment is related to our what's necessary right now as it's related to the long term goal. So my job is I have to kind of hold both perspectives. And then the the students job is they have R and R and R plus ready, not ready, not ready, but needs more. Need I, I'm not able to achieve it, not because I haven't practiced it, because I actually I'm missing some tools. Mm -hmm. So what I found is that the more detailed the lessons are, like the more diagrammed, it's much more efficient. So what the client experiences is if someone wants to work on one particular thing, we're going to go really, really deep. Generally speaking, I have people that want to work on a broad base uh, 
um, structure. So we'll go really deep on foundations of technique. We'll go really deep on the foundations of rudimental orchestration. We'll go really deep on on um, sound architecture. We'll go really deep on seeing how rudimental overlaps with uh, classical pedagogy. Uh, then we'll go really deep into stylistic adaptations, jazz, rock, funk, contemporary, to even some of the more, you know, that's, I would sort of say like, that's like the academic, like I used to be a professor. So I have like in here is like a normal person. Like there actually is, like, you know, I studied like Afro-Cuban and like tons of, like I, I have like a normal human in me. Um, and I teach often very much sort of based on the metric of, of like, if, if, if I were a university, I'm going to give that level of um, seriousness and also longitudinal cadence to the curriculum. They don't have a jury, but we do kind of have a jury because there's end term goals that we expect. And I find that the students and clients in this perspective actually put, they, they, you know, I'm not the cheapest person to work with. And they're that's they want to use this time as efficiently as I do and and so everyone who tends to work with me shows up and we create really structured goals like you're going to play this solo at this tempo or it could be like a life thing like I how do I create how do I work on my business as a teacher how do I develop my pedagogical methods how do I uh, integrate my jazz playing to these different techniques. And what's kind of cool now is I'm getting people who are really inspired by sort of the musician I am right now, which is sort of like this, I would call me sort of like a Borg drummer, you know, like, I, you know, it's sort of, if, if you looked at, uh, yeah, it, like sort of half machine sort of, with a lot of espresso kind of kind of thing and and I'm, I'm finding that 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 it's that's resonating so that's it's been cool to show that but the, i'll close with this generally speaking like one thing that i have and people have said about my playing is that i have a lot of fluidity the problem with fluidity is that people think of that as a noun versus and my client yesterday said this really beautiful phrase that i'm totally stealing it's not a force it's a process and like we we tend to want to sort of just give our habits full reign and I'm as guilty as any as anybody else but it's when we really dissect information that we find beauty through limitations and for me I find fluidity is developed through specificity and so the more specific we can be and break things down um, we start to see deeper and deeper terrains and one of the things that I'm trying to give my students, and my clients is their own auto autonomic way to develop their own system for their own personal development in that, in that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's great. I'm, I'm just processing some of that. So with, yeah, with the fluidity thing, I think, I think that's really deep and there are a bunch of things that pop out. Um, one is when people mistake uh, proximal causes for deep causes. So it's like they'll see a Marcus Gilmore sort of flow up and down the drums and they'll think I need to be looser and they won't realize that he's chunked 15 years worth of specific vocabulary to be able to turn his brain off and just flow over the drum kit. So that's one. I, I guess I want to broaden this though and just ask to the, the, the degree you're comfortable sharing and of of course, neither of us is in a position to judge our students. When I think of my students, I actually think a lot of them are far braver than I am because I've already maybe passed through some threshold. So I kind of, to use the map analogy, see what's ahead of them. But I'm asking them to take my hand and just dive eyes closed off a precipice. And a lot of them are willing to do it. So much respect to them. But with that out of the way, I am curious if you see away from all your experience that generalizes in terms of the most common ways 
students, clients who encounter you are in their own way? Like what are the most common blockers that need to be resolved in order for them to achieve success? Right now, uh, healthy self-confidence. Which is like, I'm at, I, I've always struggled with self-confidence. In my playing, I am finally, I've reached a point, like I'll, I'll, I'll never have Tony Williams ride simple. Maybe, I doubt it, you know. That being said, you know, like, you know, it's not about being the best. It's about, it's about reaching the point of Um, I don't know, like, I, there are things where the out, like, even when I'm like, there are times like, I'm the worst drummer in the world, blah, blah, blah. And then it's the daily discipline. Sometimes I'm like, Oh, that's actually kind of cool. And listening back to my record, I'm like, wow, that's actually, I'm really, really pretty. Like, I'm really proud of my record. I think that people are gonna, if you're into the, my stuff, you're gonna really dig the record. Um, uh, I used to have grandiose um, uh, self confidence, and which also, which is like I'm better than everybody. When I was younger, I had that for sure, which then became I am the worst thing of all time. And and when I started meditating, that's where things kind of changed because that's where I could take real inventory of in in a more objective field of view. Like, okay, what are my strengths and weaknesses? But the big way that I changed was when I really asked myself, what do I really want to do? Look at the goals. Who are the musicians that I want to play with? That's where I started, instead of circling, really, I changed practicing into training. I treat, I, at my best, and I'm not always this way, but at my best, music is like, when I'm behind the kid, it's like a training. Or, and, and at this point, I feel like I'm more of a craftsman creating stuff, because I have all these tools, and I have the internet, and I have, now I have music, I have like composers, like, on my record, I have this incredible um, one of one of my favorite um, composers, Ben Lucas Boyson from Berlin. He's like, we're now working on a track, and it's like everything's kind of like a, it's like a very cool, uh, creative zone that I'm in, and I want to actually. That's like, that's I want to keep expanding on that. And one reason I want to work with Trent is like. I'm never, well, Nine Inch Nails doesn't need a drummer um, and I can't do what Elon does, but I love creating textures to ambient music in particular that world. And I'm doing that now with Austin. Like that's something that I've sort of found myself in and I'm loving creating soundscapes that are evocative, um, that are kind of frightening, that are, urgent and i don't know like i kind of lost my train of thought here but but essentially are you, are you tracking this i feel like i've kind of lost myself a little bit yeah so we started out talking about how you see students in their own way and you you mentioned self-confidence which resonates and then i think that your train of thought was your journey from from something like maybe a, a grandiose sense of yourself to, you know, through the meditation to kind of a more authentic trust in your own voice. And yeah. Thanks for pulling me from the deep. So the biggest issue that I see with students, yeah, that was tangent right there. The biggest issue I see with students is, 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 is healthy self-confidence, um, which I've struggled with too. And I think a lot of us have, and, and what's really great is when you can give your students tactile information for them to become uh, informed, aware, um, uh, tools that, that ins incite and excite their creativity, um, where they are part of their own emancipation on the instrument in their own unique way. Yes. That's why, that's where like teaching is is at this point non-genre specific it's it's more i think i'm sort of at a point where the the people that i work with i'm helping them become sort of their best versions of themselves and that's certainly those 
the students and clients that come my way, I think that they're generally interested in that. Yeah. No, that really resonates. This is something I've been thinking very deeply about as well. Anyway, really appreciate your time. I've got one more question for you if you've got time. There are some drummers who came up and were primarily analog. Like the bulk of their experience was in the analog world. And then there are some who are sort of digital natives. And then I think there's a rarer crop who have kind of spanned the two sides. And I'd put you in that category. Like you've been gigging in the analog world, touring, teaching, but then you also adapted to online and, and kind of found a creative space and, in, you know, a canvas there. So I'm super interested to know from your vantage point, what do you think are the biggest pros and the biggest cons to how online everything is now, the sort of internet drum culture and Instagram and everything versus, say, 1999? I think as a, there's three aspects. There's the craftsman aspect, there's the performance aspect, and then there's the pedagogical issue. I think pedagogically, you know, I've been on drum, we've both been on Drumio. It's served, it, it's been amazing for me and it opened me up to a whole world and put a lot of pressure to, and it was great. Um, I think the pros of online is that we have everybody available to us. The cons of that is we have everybody available to us. And with drum, like this is actually a really deep question because like the thing about percussion pedagogy, it's very linear. Like there's, we generally speaking, if you're a percussionist, we learn about things in very systematic ways, which I, I, I think are actually really, really important. So like stroke types, and then we learn about sound production, then we learn about different grips as we're going to need for two and four mallets. Um, there, there, there tends to be a sort of way that it's taught that I kind of agree with. With drum set pedagogy, there's a lot of great drum drum teachers out there. Certainly there's like, and, and, and I'm good in a lot of ways, but there, and a lot of people are, might be so much better for different people than I am for those people. hundred mm percent. -hmm. Like I'm, you know, it's, it's a very individualistic thing, but um, it, it can be a little, you know, it's like the wild, wild west, you know, everybody's teaching now. So oftentimes I feel like uh, people, they, it's like we have all these TikTok videos of all these things to do. We have all this information, but we have no depth. And then it also, it, where, where I struggled before going in circles versus moving forward, people are going in really, really crazy circles, really not moving forward. And the problem is, is like, you know, what's sexy online is like, to your point about Marcus is Marcus, like he, Marcus actually played this kit. He actually, he, Chick Curry actually played this kit and Marcus played this kit in Salt Lake and he made it sound mm -hmm. incredible. And he pulled out like on this drum, right on this drum right here, he pulled the sound out of my floor tom. Like it was an upstroke sound that was the most gorgeous sound. And it's like, that's not an extent. I mean, it is an, it was an extended technique, but that was, that's like, that's really deep craftsmanship. That's, that's that percussionist practicing a downstroke 10,000 times paying attention to their upstrokes, you know, like mm -hmm. Marcus has that. And the problem with online pedagogy is that's not reinforced. Um, and that's where a teacher really is, you know, so like the, the one-on-one -on -one teacher thing is kind of still really important. Um, especially, uh, uh, you know, all those things online, it's like, um, you know, like I've been able to communicate, share ideas and work with my musical heroes. I've been able to, oh, that, that sounds great. I wonder what that would, this sounds cool. I love this kind of music. I wonder what that would sound like with this weird dotted eight over whatever thing, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to post this. Oh, he likes it. Cool. Oh, do you want to make a record? That's awesome. Let's, I mean, that's like, that's incredible. Um, and that sort of speaks to the child. Like I, I, I think at my best, sometimes I do stuff to, you know, I have an ego just like every, everybody else. And, you know, I want it to be certain 
certain stuff to be received in a particular way. At my best, um, you know, like I'll take like a Brad solo and I'll take the shape and I'll just, just like, I'll, I'll like move it up the vector system up because I just, I want to hear what it sounds like. Um, it's very experimental. And um, I think at my best, people see me going through the process and and so the intention of things are really important and i'm not always great with my intention you know like i i have struggled with that but i'm trying to be really good with my intentions now even though i'm really really focused so the online aspect with that has been fantastic um but the one thing i would say is you you want to study with people and you also want to take time to develop your own voice um I don't really like I practice every day, but I don't really warm up like in the, in a convention in the conventional sense. The first thing that I do is I, I, I want to find music that I like. I work on puzzles. I work on things that elicit somatic responses. I work on things that elicit sort of my imagination. And then once that's going, then I start giving it parameters. Then I start going, OK, look at my heights, look at my wrist. Then I then then sort of like the guy with like the tie with like wolf you know then he kind of shows up, but he shows up after, um, and so I think that even though we live in an online culture, so you use the analog term. I think that you still you want to make sure that you create a sacred space. So this is my sacred space. I, this, these are my toys. These are where this kid. What is this? You know, like what is that? How do I? You know. I feel like we don't want to lose that. And, and then if we can then express it, that's really cool. Amazing. Well, where would you send people to check you out if this is the first time they're uh, meeting you? Um, I would go to my Instagram page. I would go to my website where you can see my, um, if you're interested in my coaching, my coaching uh, uh, information is there. If that's out of your reach, I have a whole bunch of videos that I'm really proud of that are really affordable and there's tons of information on my website. Um, and yeah, um, I have some other online stuff, but those are kind of the main ones. Awesome. Well, this has been great. Um, yeah, really, really appreciate the time. Um, we went deep on a number of things. Uh, it went in a bunch of different directions than I expected, but that's great. It was like jazz. Ha, <laughs>